Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, back for part 5 of Cather's Amiga 3000 from Hell Repair, which I was getting really, really stressed with, it's taking so long. In the previous video we dealt with the RAM issues there, and then just at the start of this video here, the power connector broke. Rather than fix the Amiga kit power adapter in this video, I wrapped that up into its own video along with the Amiga 4001, and we touched briefly on the Amiga 2001 in that video as well, there'll be a link top right to that. And then just picking up here where I left off after I got the power working again. Yeah, so I freed up another chip here with the hot air. It's not too bad actually, it's just the, the paint that's come off the top here. One through the wires around here will need doing. But now I can get access to the side of this chip here, right down at the bottom. You know, as we go further up here, this side is not too bad actually. But I'll have a good toothbrush around with some vinegar and then some IPA. I don't think I need to take that off. We'll, we'll just see, see if I can get it working by cleaning up here now. Plug in any wires, check which traces. You can see, look, just the sole mass paint. So here it's not too bad, and the copper's not really affected. So yeah, I'm not going to go crazy, otherwise I'll end up with so many blooming wires. And um, there's just so much area here to cover. But the amber socket is fine as well. I mean, I will go over it with the fiberglass pen, I'll do that now. But yeah, other than a little bit of dark greyness, there's no greeny, uh, you know, alkaline got on there. And it is alkaline, it's not battery acid, it's alkaline. Use acid to treat it and then wash away with IPA. Yeah, so I'll have a good scrub around there now, I think, with the vinegar and uh, yeah, see what state it's in. So yeah, EV blog ruler features again. <laughs> so useful this ruler. You know what, I wish I'd bought like 10 of them or something. I'm not sure if Dave even sells these anymore, but this was just such a great <laughs> little idea. Yeah, thanks Dave. Uh, anyway, setting the uh, solder mask with UV light again here. Yeah, so what I'm doing is just covering the little bits around here. I've tested connectivity on the top side. Everything looks pretty good around there actually. Yeah, we've got lots of copper exposed all around this area. So you could argue, I'm being a wee bit lazy, but you know what? Trying to remove every one of these passives, every single component around here. I would spend the next two weeks messing around with this, cleaning up the solder, you know, tinning the traces with solder. I don't think it needs it. It is literally just, you know, the, the solder mask paint that's come off. So it's always going to look a bit bronzy around this area. Right up around that ramp, no issues either. You know, it was just this bottom side that was a bit dirty. We've cleaned there now, it looks good. Now, the, obviously, there could be a wire or something, but I've inspected from the underside. That's the telltale sign. You'll see corrosion on the wires on the underside where it's, you know, where there's an issue. If you see corroded wires, you need to deal with them. And they're just here where this ram is. So I can just plug the, the few wires that are there and uh, hopefully it should be okay. There might still be the old broken trace around these two chips here because, well, it's what really bodgy under there and I didn't really complete finishing testing that as I was uh, doing the repairs here. So yeah, that might be where we end up, something on the 7.4 there or the 04. I've ordered some new chips with longer legs to replace the 86, one or two of these chips, I think both those chips there actually, and this one, because when they've got short legs, you can see that's suffering from chip creep. You know, you don't use it for 24 hours and it, it slides out slightly on one side. And whilst it still works, it's going to lead to, you know, reliability issues. So, yeah, I'll just keep these uh, as spares. I know they work. I can always just solder them directly onto some board in future. And that's what I would do when you've got short legs like that. So, coming back to the sockets, I haven't used any turn pins on here. Uh, that would be a good candidate. If I had a socket, the turn pin socket that size, I would have fitted one there and there and there and there because when they've got short pins they fit really well now I've had lots of people saying oh turn pins are awful because the chips you know don't make a very good connection because of the round socket and a, a square pin going in it just presses on the corners and that's kind of true but if they're like these where I've had to you know clean the legs up and you know use brain stuff on them to make, make them super tidy and clean afterwards you tend to find that they're really snug into a turn pin socket a turn pin socket the disadvantage is if you take it a Chip out and in, out and in, out and in. After just three or four removals and inserts, it starts to get sloppy. So I agree with that point in general. You know, dual wipe is always better, really, when you've got full length legs and um, for chips that are going in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. But turn pin sockets are primarily used for you know devices with round pins, hence the round holes, and that's where they work best. 
Yeah, so another quick tip, and I'm not sure I've mentioned this one before, but when you're soldering your, uh, you know, a couple of solder points to hold your socket in position before you flip it over, inspect all the pins are in, your socket's level and everything. Don't solder diagonally opposite VCC and ground. Uh, so, I, you know, I don't do that, but I don't think I've ever mentioned it. I always solder, like, I don't know, the second one on this side and the second one on that side. Something that's not connected to a giant rail, because then if you do need to adjust it or completely remove it, it's far easier to get off. Anyway, that is looking nice and strong straight and level and all the pins are through so yeah I just commit to soldering that on and then I need to unblock the holes on the underside of this one here yeah the other thing I've been doing here is ground and VCC if you can't unblock them just uh, you know try and remove as much solder as you can so you get a little dimple in the surface and then use a drill bit that is exactly uh, sorry, yeah, the right size as you know the same size as the holes potentially slightly marginally small this one's exactly the right size though um, and then you avoid you know putting too much heat onto those ground VCC pads because you'll lose pads on these I haven't lost any yet but uh, you know some of the solder mask has worn away on the other side and stuff and you can see a little bit of heat damage from where I've struggled at the start trying to remove one or two things on here and the corrosion is the thing you know the corrosion is the thing that makes it really hard to get some of the uh, solder points freed up on uh, these Boards. Yeah, I might uh, swap that socket. I don't know. It's, the cap makes a really good connection there, so <laughs> it's a feature, isn't it? It's like I say, it's an undocumented feature. Yeah, so it's a horror story under here. Lots of these wires are going to be redone, tidied up, shortened. Uh, There's the odd really fine gauge wire here that will be uh, swapped out for something a bit more sturdier. It sounded like a good idea using a really fine gauge wire for one or two of them, and then yeah, it is on trace when you're actually fixing a trace, but not from point to point unless it's covered with. Um, solder mask paint uh, anyway I'm going to try and see where the socket is now it's here isn't it so it's just it's quite possibly the worst bit of soldering I've ever done I'll just bob into them now and uh, equal the size yeah one of the ones over here like third or fourth on the right yeah it's flowing now it wasn't flowing very well at all before those two in fact just need a wee bit more is and that one. Yeah, there we go. That's pretty good. So uh, I just need to add the two wires because there were two wires on here. The ones here, fine one. Where's the other one? The other one's up here. I just bent these out of the way. So I need to put those fixes back on. But I need to unblock the holes here. So we'll try and do that now. I'll try and move one or two of these wires just carefully out of the way here. This is why I add a bit of extra length on these when I'm doing this sort of thing, just to you know, allow you a bit of uh, leeway to move them around. Uh, and then we'll attempt to unblock these holes from this side. Anyway, I'll report back in a minute, just as we're about to get the other socket on. Right, so wrist wrap on, got the um, amber here. The good thing is, uh, I can test my amber as well, I've got one of my own that came from the amazing Screamo. I'm not going to go overboard here, I'm just going to just gently clean these and then I'll wipe over with cardboard and some deoxid as well. But before we do that, we'll clean with vinegar actually. Uh, sorry, not vinegar. Um, yeah, we'll clean with some vinegar, then we'll do some IPA. And that bin there is black. So, hmm. Hope Amber's alright. There we go, it's come off. Yeah, so to just be on the safe side, as I say, we'll clean with uh, some vinegar. Then I'll use some IPA. Yeah, with the IPA, I am uh, going to just use the toothbrush just to get right in between the pins here. And of course, this was done to Agnes, Denise, Paula, and all of the chips on the uh, what any that needed solder cone have been, you know, used the braid on them and stuff. But they mostly just cleaned up pretty well, actually, without any heat or anything like that, or any use with the iron. So that looks nice and clean. So let's get Amber 
into a socket. Right, where's pin one? So pin one's here. And then let's try and find pin one on there. Yeah, pin one is at the bottom here, actually. Surprisingly. Oop. If that one is to be believed. So let's press number back in. The next thing to do is to clean up these crusty ram chips. So I would imagine these are not going to make a particularly good connection, actually. Anyway, it's a multi-step approach, as I say. We'll do the stuff with the desolder braid on that in a minute, then we'll clean with some IPA and a toothbrush, then use the uh, pliers to straighten the legs. But we'll do the same thing to both of these. Yeah, so what I usually do here is just get uh, a wee bit of flux onto the braid here. Use pliers as a clamp. If you push the chip, you know, up to the left hand side like uh, that. Yeah, as you uh, hold the uh, pliers like this, you can sort of, you know, heat and slide across the pins. He says, and struggles. Let's just move this around that way a little bit. Yeah, so that's one side done. It just needs cleaning up. It's all uh, got, got lots of flux on it. Let's just rotate that around. And let's have a go on this one. And if they're a bit crowded, just go up and down them like that. And a cotton bud with IPA, and we'll just try and clean over there now, see what they look like. Yeah, a bit better. They're still... Uh, yeah, that's actually a lot better. So then we could, for good measure, use pliers, but I need to remind myself that Cather's provided me with this beauty. So uh, let's just use it. Press the chip nice and flat and squeeze. That's so cool. Thanks ever so much for that, Chris. Yeah, from one Chris to another. Hang on. Yeah, there's still a wee bit sticky out here on the outside. You know, probably because they were bent over, I can still feel that. So I will just go over these like this. That, that tool is useful for straightening them if they are splayed outwards or inwards. But in terms of just getting rid of the uh, pointiness on the ends, that is the best way to do it. So um, we'll just give it one more go with that for good measure. Yeah, I think those are pretty good. So, uh, yeah, without further ado, let's get that into that socket there. I'll do the same thing with that, remove all this crusty solder and stuff off here and do the exact same thing. And would you believe it, <laughs> we have a VGA. I'm shocked at that. So yeah, it's wobbling. Now there's a little uh, trim adjustment right next to the VGA connect. I'll show you that in a minute. Hmm. Let me try adjusting, uh, yeah, this is the thing. As soon as you touch the trim cap on the metal tool, that happens. Yeah, this is where I might need to scope because I can't get it back in range now. Hang on. Yeah, I put some deoxid in there, and as I put it in, the picture went perfect. So, you know what? That's not bad, is it? That's not bad at all. Yeah, so you're at a slight angle there, just testing the video stuff out. Um, it's perfect, isn't it? It's hard to believe all of that corrosion around there and the scandal of stuff is fine. Oh, it's wobbling a little bit now. That's that trim cap, it does, if I just tap it a little bit. Yeah, it does still need a bit of a cleaning, so the wobbling there, just ignore for the moment. And that's why that's a bit jittery, I think. But it could also be that little trim thing on the uh, end of the board there next to the VGA connector. 
Let me just touch that uh, position there with the uh, tool. Yeah, so it's stabilising it. So yeah, that just needs a bit of a flush out, that uh, variable cap. Well, I'm amazed. So we've got all of the RAM working. The floppy drive works, CIA's work, real-time clock is working. I need to do a battery mod to that, that's something else to do. Audio is working, filter. Yep. <laughs> Fantastic. So, wrist strap back on. Let's just switch this off. Let's try the live two, gotta go fast run. Now, what I'm not sure about here is, is this gonna clash? And I don't think it will. I was gonna say, is this gonna clash with the onboard fast memory? And I think, because we've got 16 meg, there's probably gonna be in the Zorro free range, isn't it? Or local, yeah, local 42 bit in that range. So, let's try Liv's card. Uh, stick it there, I think. I will test each of these slots. There we go. And I'm assuming that this is right. Front, 3000 front's going to be here. Um, the other, you know, they're upright in the 4000 like that. So let's just put my hand on there, switch it on. No errors. And we've got the same screen up there and on the VG as well. Clicking our uh, top left there. It's booting from the disc. Let's have a look at memory. Nope. So it's not detected that extra RAM, has it? Maybe it's been told to shut up. Right, instead of that, let's try the AT bus card. So that's an IDE controller. So I don't know why that wouldn't work. Uh, you know, this makes me think there's a Zorro fault. I really don't want to have to start to go digging around Zorro as well with this. Honestly, this will have been the worst blooming Amiga ever, I think. The number of different faults it's had in different sections. Right, that's that in. Yeah, and I've got a compact flash card here that I use with the AT card. Let's just plug that in. And plug that in. It's powered by the uh, AT card, that, so let's just switch that on. Aha! Not a DOS disk. It is a DOS disk, that's lies. Let me just disconnect and reconnect it. Sometimes it does this. And this is one of the things I found with the uh, some of these compact flash cards. Certain systems, you can get that error. Uh, and sometimes it depends on how clean the connections are. Sometimes it depends on where it is in the uh, Zorro slots there. So I'll take that out, put a different compact flash card in, because I think that that's what this issue is. I think it's like being wee bit sulky about that compact flash card. So I'll try one of my TF530 CF cards here. Let's plug that in. This one may work. I mean, the good news is though, it seems to auto boot from that. Yeah, not a DOS disk. The other possibility here though, is it's about the version of uh, Kickstart actually. Because if it's got 1.4, it's like hybrid between 1.3 and 2, isn't it? And this is the thing, these compact flash cards are all set with Workbench 2 or greater petitions, you know, it's the actual, uh, everything about the drive is wrong in terms of what the Kickstart's expecting, so it's probably going to do the same with this one, this is a third compact flash card. Yeah, same thing. So, yeah, we can't get any further in terms of testing uh, hard disk that way, because I haven't got a Kickstart for it. It's so annoying. I might as well take this out then, and wait for the moment. Well, at least that was detected by Zorro and did boot, so maybe you just can't add uh, 8 meg from the gotta go fast run. I don't think there's an easy way to disable that RAM either, that's the problem. We'll try the gotta go fast card again. It, I know it's, it's a bit dirty, the edge there, let's just pull that back out. Yeah, so maybe it's just a bit of dirt in the slot or something. Let's try that. And of course I could try it in a few different slots here. What is strange to me is that it would boot from a hard disk automatically, but not boot from a floppy disk automatically. It's just like really bizarre. Ah oh, yeah, it must have been a dirty slot because look, we've now got 20 meg fast. The Live 2 card is working fine. It's added the, hang on a minute, has it added it? It's, we had 16, it's added four. Uh, yeah, I think it's in the four meg position, is it? Oh yeah, I'm getting confused. I'm thinking it's got 16 meg. It hasn't. It's got 12. So that's right. If I put it back in 8 meg, sorry, I'm having a senior moment here. Switch it back on. 
20 meg makes sense, it's 12 plus 8. Yeah, memory, 20 meg, test regions. Let's do the 8 meg from lift 2. And that is working. Woohoo! So, you know what? I'm calling this a success. All I need to do now is sort the LEDs out and have a little bit of a clean up of the board. You can see that's gone around 16 times now on the Gotta Go Fast card from Live 2, the 8 meg that that provides. Um, now, this is Zora free, so I mean, I could take the 100, sorry, is it 256 meg, isn't it? Yeah, 256 meg card out of my A4000, but yeah, I don't really want to do that, to be honest. And uh, I've got no reason to suspect there'd be a problem with the Zorro, to be honest. Um, yeah, but anyway, I need to fix the LEDs because those aren't working properly, certainly the power one. And then test the serial power ports and then just test it for a period of time. Do the tap test and stuff because this is the thing, you know, I'll guarantee if I tap this with a screwdriver now, it'll probably uh, crash. Because I think we've got a bad connection somewhere. Let's just try it, let's just do the tap test. Oh, it's still there. So I don't know, honestly, don't know how stable it's going to be. Anyway, we'll do some burn-in testing on it. So, other than final cleanup, there is one final thing wrong with this. The LEDs are not working. So, I'm trying to make sense of this. If we probe uh, these pins up here, I've just been looking at the schematics, hang on, that one. This is the LED, watch. So, the filter on and off toggles that. It's a buffer, 7407, it's output, should toggle. And I'm toggling the filter off and on, hang on, let me start the music again. So filter on, off, on, off. It's input, on, off, on, off. So yeah, it's output is doing nothing. And it's make sure that's not short to ground via some bodge wire somewhere or something. Um, the other one is over here, and I think that's the scuzzy LED perhaps. Yeah, so yeah, if there is an issue. I think I need a new 7407. Right, no mystery at all. It's a 7407, it's an open collector device. So you need a pull-up, it's not capable of pulling high, you can just pull low. It's a high voltage rated part that up to 30 volts actually. I'm not sure if that's on just on the output or, I presume it probably is. It's probably, you know, high voltage rated on the output. So you can have, you know, up to 30 volts I think and it'll pull low. Um, obviously current is something to uh, think about though as well, but anyway, yes, yeah, so that's probably the issue. It's probably, you know, a cable that connects on this with a PCB that's got a number of resistors on it and the LEDs. And that's why this 5 volts on here is so that it can feed 5 volts to the uh, assembly there and pull it high. I mean, we could test that. I could, I'm not going to bother. I'm sure that's all right. Uh, I was just puzzled why I was not seeing any logic state change here. And it's because it's low and, you know, when it goes the other way, it's still low. Well, it's not. It's actually kind of high impedance. And that's where if you had a pull-up, it would pull high. So, uh, yeah, the SCSI LED will test, because um, we should see a ch uh, change. Oh, hang on, the SCSI LED works the same way, I think, doesn't it? Yeah, we're going to get the same thing with the SCSI LED, but, yeah, anyway. The main thing is the connection from here uh, just needs uh, securing and fixing a bit better that goes to the SCSI point there. The, um, I've tested the resistors here, and these are for providing the connections to the LEDs and everything's there yeah the resistors are alright and the connections between here and the 07 are okay uh, just trying to cover some of the bits of um, solder mask paint here I'm having a bit of a scrub up here now so this is the area of the deinterlace stuff I've just replaced some of the really fine wires I had there with Kynar just to make it a bit more of a substantial repair because the coil wire yeah it's a good idea on the top traces not on the underside on one or two of the connections here and I did have I think there were three three wires I've just removed and replaced with kind of yeah hopefully all those wires are still intact so I'm just desoldering the uh, PLL chip here and the reason being is because whilst the scan double is working it's really fuzzy in certain modes and often it doesn't work when you first turn it on you've got to mess with the pot now it's not the pot I've had the pot off the board cleaned it up tested it it works okay I think what's going on here is a wee bit of corrosion around this that is influencing the chip because it's quite a sensitive chip
yeah, so not masses of corrosion under there. We lost the one pad that's not used. But yeah, there is some dirt at the bottom. Uh, you know, muck and corrosion just on that bottom there. Unblock holes. Clean up the chip and get the chip back on because I'm sure the chip is fine. So many, many, many hours later, I've had all sorts of nightmares with this. I had to glue the uh, wires down, as you saw on the inside, one or two of those. Uh, yeah, if we remove the jumper here, put that into uh, open. Um, in fact, I don't think you need to put it into open. I think you can just remove it. Let's just put it down there anyway. Yeah, that's in the open position. Probe on uh, the second uh, pin here. I'll point you with a scope. Yeah, there's a good guide I found online, uh, I'll post a link down below. I need to dial into 14.1878 megahertz. Yeah, so if I probe uh, the middle pin, yeah, you can see we're not too far off. If you look at the frequency count there, I'll highlight it. So we're going down a bit, up a bit, and on. It's down a bit. Now, this is thing super bloody sensitive. Getting there, we're not going to get it much more accurate than that with this because I just like literally not even moving it, just like pressing a bit. Let's see what that looks like. Yeah, and we're getting nothing. This is the thing that this tutorial, although it's yeah, it's helpful, it tells me the frequency. It doesn't make any sense. I've checked all connectivity here. Right, the scan double stuff is finally sorted. It's taken an incredible amount of time again. I'm just so fed up with working on this, really, if I'm completely honest. I honestly feel like taking a hammer to it. We're, we're there though, I think. There's just one bad connection. And you know what? This is going to be the most annoying part of this repair for me because it's, it's literally one connection. There's one connection somewhere and when the board's cold or it's seated a certain way. It's, uh, it, you know, you get the white screen kickstart and then it, it resets itself. It resets itself. It resets itself. And uh, you turn the board upside down, start measuring traces until it's working again. And I'm like, oh my god, what? where is this connection? It's driving me to despair. And this is the problem. This is the problem you get from like this. Anyway, the problem here, I had two missing connections on the O4, the HC04 that the scan double uses. The last one was on pin 5, which goes to the little variable adjustment on the back. It's a little variable resistor, I think. But you can see now, it's crystal clear that it's solid. This is what this should look like. If I go back on here, if you go into static, it should look like that, crystal clear, nice solid alternating, again crystal clear, solid, very pleased, that is uh, really good actually, gives really good video output and the colour bars look pretty darn good. So there'll be a link down to that guide that I mentioned earlier, it's a good useful point of reference. The one thing I found that wasn't accurate from my perspective was on that guide it says don't use a socket, the PLL is super sensitive and you'll have all sorts of problems. I had no issues at all with the socket and I would suggest if he was having problems with the socket maybe he's got a missing connection somewhere like I had because I had problems with the socket when I had missing connections to the O4. As soon as I dealt with those bad connections there it was rock solid stable. Really 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 crystal clear picture. As good as the AGA Multifix. Yeah, so we come back to the uh, scan double side briefly in the next part as I test my amber on this board. But I felt it was worth just having a look at this page of the schematics here because this new stuff here that we've not seen on other Amigas, we, we looked at the same sort of functionality here on the AGA Multifix. There'll be a link top right to that. So you can see amber on the left hand side there. You've got the RGB inputs there that come from Denise ultimately. And what does this circuit do? It provides VGA output, you know, so you've got your normal a standard definition, you know, analog RGB signals that go out. But in addition to that, you've also got deinterlaced VGA and it can output interlaced VGA through there as well, I think. So in the bottom left there, that's the chip that I removed from the PCB, cleaned up underneath and there were a few connections to the O4. Uh, and I'll highlight where the uh, O4 is there, you can see that. Yeah, so the NE564, it's a PLL, you know, phase locked loop. So because we're dealing with video here, and video, you know, you've got a lot of data, and it has to be transmitted extremely fast to the display. Yeah, you've got a lot of pixel data, haven't you, for all of the rows and columns of pixels, and, you know, 50 times a second or 60 times a second. 
uh, that's an awful uh, fast, uh, you know, and a lot of data you need to transmit to the TV or CRT or display or whatever. And this is why we've got these two clocks coming in. Well, there's actually three or so clocks. You've got a, a, a four, two different 14 megahertz ones. You've got uh, VDE 14M and VDE 28M. And that is where that PLL comes in to synchronize those two clocks. When we say synchronize, we're talking about just shifting the edge and holding, holding them against each other at the right place so that they are you know, perfectly aligned in the way that you want them aligned and those go into amber and amber is then you know clocking the pixel data appropriately so as it comes in it can send out you know the individual four bits for red green and blue to the ram on the right hand side so you've got frame ram which holds a complete frame of data you know uh, interlaced because what is this it's a deinterlacer isn't it if something is deinterlaced, it's a, you know a full progressive set of scan lines. You, know, you may have, I don't know, let's just argue and say, say 640 by 400. I don't know whether that's the resolution it uses. It probably is. But if you've got 400 scan lines, yeah, and all of those are displayed on your TV in a single frame, that's progressive. But interlaced, you know, old TVs couldn't do that kind of resolution, so they had to be interlaced so it would show the odd scan lines 200 of them and then the even ones 200 of them and you'd have a couple of frames of data as far as i can understand you know the odd scan lines the even scan lines and they would alternate between what is displayed there for you know every other you know full screen of display if you like and that's why on the 1084s you'll have seen when i did the repair of that will be linked top right it flickers like mad and interlaced because that's how it worked it, it flickers between you know one frame and the other crts yes it's still noticeable to the eye but because of the persistence of vision of the phosphor, you know, it takes a bit of time for the image to fade away effectively in terms of how it affects, you know, your vision in terms of how you see it. It would trick the eye into seeing a full display. And the flickering is because, you know, the, li the lines are overlapping with each other. You see one frame, then the other, then the first one, then the other one, etc. Uh, and that's, yeah, flicker. And hence why this is called a flicker fixer. It de it produces a progressive display taking those two frames of you know odd and even scan lines and just outputting a progressive single frame to the VGA display. So as I say, you've got two different types of RAM. You've got frame RAM that holds an entire frame, and then you've got line RAM that holds a single scan line. Now, each of these, if you look at them, you've got um, eight inputs and eight outputs on those line RAM chips there to the right hand side. The frame RAM, are the you know, like U470, 471, 472, those are to the left hand side. And each of those has four bits, you know, four inputs, four outputs. So you've got, you know, one of those chips dedicated to red, one of them dedicated to blue, one of them dedicated to green. And the red, green and blue out of each of those goes into four of the input bits on the three sorry four line rams there and because those line rams have eight inputs and eight outputs you know those are capable of dealing with the uh, alternate scan lines yeah so you know you can output from the frame ram into the line ram capture an entire line for of that uh, particular pixel you know say i don't know red um, and then the other four bits can be used for a different color and green and that's how it's done the first chip at the top there u473 is capturing the red and the green it's doing two calls that one chip and then the one below it is uh, sorry the, the delayed if you actually look to the signal to the left you've got delayed because it delays it in order that you can output everything all at once in one single frame you know you've got one frame that's um, delayed uh, effectively so yeah, the, the next chip down, use 474, that's got blue delayed. So between the, the whole of the top chip and half of the uh, second chip down, U474, we've got red, green, and blue delayed signals going in there. Yeah, and then it, it, it can output by red, green, and blue connections on the right side there, the data are out on those chips. But then the two chips on the bottom of the page here, you've got uh, red, green, and blue. Those aren't delayed. And again, the red, green, and blue signals go out on the right side. They're actually suffixed. The ones at the bottom are suffixed with a C, yeah? And the three uh, related to the top two chips are suffixed with a D. 
And this is where we come back to amber for the actual final output of these signals. Yeah, so you've got you know three delayed colour bits and three standard colour bits. And if you look at the left hand side of amber, you've got red D, green D, blue D on the left hand side there, and then red C, green C, and blue C. Yeah, so it's able to take you know the delayed scan line, the one that's not, and output on the right hand side there. You've got you know four colour bits for each which then go to a hybrid. Now this is, don't mistake this for the normal hybrid, this is second hybrid. So this hybrid is doing the DAC stuff, you know, it's uh, just tidying up the, the, the output there, you know, resist the ladder internally there to get the colors all right and stuff. Um, yeah, and then you've got analog red, analog green, analog blue. And that goes out to the VGA. And Amber's producing the uh, H-Sync and V-Sync that go to the VGA connector there as well just to get everything pixel perfect in terms of timing so anyway looking at this page of schematics you know it can give you some ideas on where to look if you've got a specific problem you know you'd need to test uh, you know like I did using the uh, Amiga test kit there the interlaced screens and things and uh, you know uninterlaced uh, you know uh, progressive and just go through the different uh, screen modes and and see what's happening with you know your output really if you had a particular color problem and stuff you, you could look at the schematics here and you could work out perhaps which chips to target there based on you know the rgb markings on this page there's also a 74 als 74 it's marked als i don't think it was on the actual board it was just an ls i could be wrong but anyway it's marked uh, u480 there 74 als 74a yeah, so you've got a flip-flop. But in fact, this uh, yeah, there's two gates to that. There's one at the bottom as well, uh, same chip. One of the 40 megahertz clocks goes into the clock signal of both of those. Yeah, and ultimately, just looking at that, it seems like the output, the Q output, certainly at the top one of those, is going to the right enable, I think, on U472. Probably, yeah, all of them. So, you know, that flip-flop is enabling the right so that these can be written to as the pixel data is fed from amber and at some point i may try to produce in a cpld my own replacement of amber actually i wouldn't mind having a go at that i've talked about that a little bit in discord it's um i can't imagine it being that difficult to achieve the hardest bit is producing a proto board with a cpld on it and wiring everything up so that all of the connections are in the right places uh, effectively actually trying to get it to go into a plcc socket could be is the, is the biggest challenge i would say but the complexity here is if you look at uh, you know the line ram actually on the right hand side that you know you've got r s t r r s t w read and write signals there it's getting the timing of both of those uh, you know the on the line ram and similarly on the frame ram all synchronized in such a way that the uh, pixel data goes to the right chip at the right time uh, that's the complexity in this you know uh, i guess it, it may have been quite complex back in the day and i'm not suggesting it's easy but that's all amber's doing that really is all amber's doing there might be a bit of complexity when you start to look at some of the oddball resolutions in the amiga that that might be where things get complicated so yeah, anyway, I, I might have a go at that at some point in the future. I'm surprised no one's done it already, to be honest, but I mean, you've got things like the AGA Multifix, so you could argue it has been done because the code there, and in fact, that's a good starting point for a project like that if you wanted to have a go yourself, and that's probably what I would do. And in terms of the adjustment there, you can see the trim cap there, VC472 to 7 picofarad. I, I do have some of those new. I didn't need to replace the one that was on there. I think at one point when I had problems, I swapped over to a new one and then found it was just the same. I tested the old one and it was working perfectly from the you know two to seven peak of forward range there. So it has the original one back on after it was being cleaned out a little bit. And the three pin jumper, I believe is just down below that to the right there. And you've got VDE14M as the second pin. And that's what we were scoping there. It's a case of just getting that 40 megahertz clock dialing just right as you adjust you know vc 470 uh, but you, you've got to remember to remove the uh, you know open the, the loop there the jumper 482 i just pulled the jumper off i think but you can yeah just put it to between two and three and in fact that's what i ended up doing wasn't it? i put it back on between two and three there is that other little variable resistor or whatever it is it might be another variable cap 
that sits on the back there. I'm struggling to find where it is on the schematics here. Yeah, there it is, VR470 phase adjust. So yeah, that's just like a, a fine adjustment for the phase there. Yeah, you tend to find that that's your final adjustment really. You know, you do the variable cap first, get your frequency right and everything, then close the loop and then just use that little variable trim uh, on the back there. And uh, you can use a metal tool on that one. It's got a metal head on it. Um, and I think it's it's just a variable resistor. Yeah, it is, it's 1K, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so that felt like a good place to bring this video to an end. There will be a part five. I do hope you found the video interesting. Please like, share, subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel, please see the coffee and Patreon donations below. Those things just help keep the channel going. They help me pay for all the consumables, flux, cotton buds, components, tools, etc. And keep the lights on. So yeah, thank you very much for watching. I'll catch you in the next video.